at nature. That's good. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm Paula Lance. I'm the James Hudak Professor of Health Policy and Professor of Public Policy here at the Ford School of Public Policy. And it's my distinct pleasure to welcome you all today and to be moderating this <coughs> panel with some of my favorite people and a new friend um, on this important topic of racial justice and public policy. So um, we're delighted that all of you are here in the room with us. There's people watching online. Thank you all so much for joining us. I do want to take a moment and acknowledge a special person in the audience, and that is our Dean, Celeste Watkins Hayes. Uh, thank you, first of all, for organizing such an inspiring and important two days of events here at the Ford School, but also thank you so much for your inspired leadership and creativity and your day-to-day -day leading the charge here at the Ford School. We love you. Thank you so much. Okay. Also want to acknowledge um, a sponsor of our panel today. It's the Center for Racial Justice here at the Ford School and also our media partner, which is Detroit Public Television. All right, so for the run of show here today, um, I'm gonna do some very brief introductions, um, and then our panelists will tell you a bit more about themselves and their work in the space of being in academia, but also working in many, many different ways on issues related to racial justice. Um, I then have a few questions to pose to the panel. They, all, they have important things to say. I'm just going to apologize ahead of time. We're, we're going to run out of time. We don't have enough time <laughs> to, this is a big topic. There's lots um, for them to share. We're going to try to get through uh, as much as we can and carve out some time at the end to get some questions from the, the audience, both in the room and online uh, uh, as well. If you're watching online, you can um, submit a question by cl clicking a link on the web page. And if you're here, there should be little pieces of paper with QR codes on them throughout the room, are they there? Okay, so you can use that to, to submit a question as well. And my colleagues, Katrina Hammond and Kellen Epstein will be helping moderate the Q&A session. All right, ready to go? Ready to meet the panelists? Okay, let's start with E. Patrick Johnson, who is the Dean of the School of Communication and the Annenberg University Professor at Northwestern University. Dean Johnson is a prolific performer. If we have time, maybe you'll sing for us, I don't know. <laughs> um, he's a scholar and he's an inspiring teacher whose research and artistry has greatly impacted African American studies, performance studies, gender and sexuality studies, as well as communication, science, and study. Kathy Cohn is with us today as well. Kathy is the David and Mary Winton Green Distinguished Service Professor at the University of Chicago where she's worn many administrative hats and has a new role coming up, I learned last night. <laughs> uh, Professor Cohn is a political scientist, scholar, and social activist, and much of her work focuses on black politics from the vantage point of intersectionality. Also with us today is a new colleague for us at the Ford School, Mo Torres. He is a Michigan Society of Fellows postdoctoral scholar and also an assistant professor in both the Department of Sociology and the Ford School here. As a sociologist, Professor Torres' research and teaching interests are in political economy, urban politics, and race class inequality. He's currently work working on a book, which I cannot wait to read, which explores the politics of fiscal crisis and urban austerity in Michigan from the 1970s to the present. And then also, my colleague and friend here at the Ford School, Ann Chi Lin. Ann is a professor of public policy here at the Ford School, and also she's the director of the Lieberthal Rogel Center for Chinese Studies here at the University of Michigan. She's a political scientist and um, uh, has a great body of work 
More recently, her work has been focusing on how people experience and respond to policy implementation, diving into the reactions of people who are targeted by public policy with a special focus on this happening in racialized context. So please join me in welcoming our panelists for the day. All right, so um, to start, um, there's more you could learn about all these people, you could read, read their bios, but um, I've asked them to all to just take a few minutes and give you um, a couple of highlights regarding how racial and ethnic inequality and racial justice figure into their scholarly work, their artistic endeavors, their community and public engagement, their uh, public policy uh, work, activism, however they want to further introduce themselves to you. So we'll start with Dean Johnson. It's wonderful to be here. Um, I consider um, Dean Watkins Hayes not only a friend but family and uh, I miss her dearly. You stole her away from us. <laughs> um, so sorry, not sorry. But, it, <laughs> but I'm happy that it's only a, a four-hour drive or you know a, a quick plane ride away from her. Um, I often describe myself as an academic trickster because I don't sit easily in any discipline or any field. Um, much of my work is, most of my scholarly work is um, qualitative um, and with different kinds of methods, including ethnography and oral history. Um, and my artistic work and my scholarly work dovetail uh, with one another, they inform the other. And, and most of my work engages marginalized communities um, who are marginalized based on their uh, racial, gender, or sexual identity, or their regional identity. Much of my work focuses on the U.S. South. And specifically, I've done two big oral history projects, uh, one focusing on black gay men of the South and uh, another project on black lesbians of the South. And uh, I'll talk more when we get into our conversation about the specific policy implications of, of that work. Um, but my artistic work as well is based on uh, that uh, scholarly research, I performed the narratives that I um, collected over the years, and uh, that's been uh, wonderful. Taking those stories to um, spaces that um, have the idea that no gay people live in the South, <laughs> uh, which is curious to me. <laughs> um, but. Um, Elevating those stories in a way that uh, can lead, might lead to policy change, but we'll get into that later. Thank you. My turn? Professor Cohen, Okay, yes. fantastic. Uh, I, too, want to thank our dear Dean Watkins Hayes for the invitation to participate in this wonderful event. I am not at Northwestern, but I represent Chicago. <laughs> and we, we miss you also. Um, but since I'm a graduate, um, Michigan, I, I think it's okay that you're here. <laughs> I'm going to start maybe outside of the academy and just say, I promise you, you'll stop me, um, two minutes about my upbringing. Because uh, when I was invited, I kept saying, I've said to everyone, I don't do policy. I don't do policy. Um, but the more I thought about it, my life is defined by policy, right? I am what is considered to be an affirmative action baby. Um, I had an opportunity for better educational opportunities because our house, when we were young, was taken, I say, by urban renewal. Mm -hmm. And my parents decided, okay, we're going to move us out of this predominantly black neighborhood into a predominantly white neighborhood. Within two years, the new predominantly white neighborhood was predominantly black again <laughs> yeah. because of white flight. Um, and so I feel like everything about my upbringing was about thinking about the complexity, the beauty, the resilience, the difficulties faced by black people in a political environment defined by anti-blackness. Um, and so I couldn't imagine being a scholar that wasn't deeply anchored in thinking about questions of race and racial justice. Um, and I think because of that upbringing, because of the expectations 
that my family sent me, I would say, into the academy with, that my community sent me into the academy with. I'm always thinking about questions of not only kind of the struggles that black people face, but I want to emphasize the complexity, and here we might think about the framework of intersectionality, right? To think about the ways in which class plays a role. Sexuality, gender, and I don't do region, but maybe I should do region, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, my first work, uh, as Paula knows, was on HIV and AIDS and the ways in which black communities responded to that. Um, both from those who had what we might consider to be indigenous power and those who are being stigmatized and demonized, all within black communities, right, that type of complexity. And then more recent work is really focusing on young people, and in particular young people of color, thinking about their positionality um, with regards to politics, but the ways in which the filters of race, racism, anti-blackness um, shape their politics and how we might think of uh, their, their future politics. So I'll stop there and turn it over to Mo. So I'll join the chorus in celebrating uh, Dean Watkins' days, except from the other perspective to say that I'm very happy you're here and not in <laughs> Chicago, personally. Um, it was kind of a surreal moment for me in a, a few different ways. One, I was a, an MPP student here, and I think I took like calculus and microecon in this classroom. So it's weird to be on this side of, uh, of the table. Um, and also, I mentioned uh, to Professor Cohen yesterday um, I don't think I told you this part, but actually my uh -oh. senior thesis, the theoretical framing, was based on your 1997 article mm -hmm. uh, in JLQ. So it's a very, very happy Thank to you. Very <laughs> happy to you. Um, so my work is on urban fiscal crisis, uh, and specifically here in Michigan. Uh, as you all probably know, uh, Michigan has no shortage of fiscal crises, from big cities like Detroit and Flint uh, to very small cities like Benton Harbor, Inkster, Highland Park, Hamtramck, the list goes on and on and on. Um, but I appreciate, Paula, your, your emphasis on inequality in your question, because many people, I think, know the story of Detroit as a story of urban decline, of white flight, of deindustrialization, of the collapse of the automobile industry, and just essentially a lot of kind of sadness and, and misery and, and social problems in the city of Detroit. Uh, but I'm really interested in, in inequality, a relationship of uh, who has a lot of resources and who has many fewer. And so when you zoom out a little bit from the city of Detroit to Metro Detroit, you have a very different story. Uh, Detroit's population is about 600,000, but in Metro Detroit, there are, almost, there are four, almost 4.5 million people in the metro area. Detroit has a lot of poverty and a lot of, uh, a lot of social problems in the city of Detroit. Uh, but actually, Metro Detroit is one of the wealthiest metropolitan areas in the country, even with the rates of poverty in the city of Detroit. Uh, some of the wealthiest cities in Michigan and in the Midwest and actually in the country are in Metro Detroit. Uh, so Bloomfield Hills, Gross Point, they're very wealthy places. And so when I think about inequality from a metropolitan level, uh, my questions that I ask are not, you know, what went wrong in Detroit to cause all the problems that the city is facing, uh, but rather thinking about sort of the metropolitan economy as a whole, how did we get to a point or we decided it was okay to have a city like Detroit with high rates of poverty and, and extreme uh, sort of blight and problems throughout the city right next to some of the most affluent communities in the entire country. And so uh, Professor Derek Hamilton yesterday asked us, you know, what is an economy for? And I think one way to answer that from the perspective of Metro Detroit, the purpose of our economy, the way we've built it, uh, is essentially to make sure that we funnel as few resources as possible into places like Detroit, Flint, Benton Harbor, and other places, and hoard as many as we can in the surrounding metro area suburbs. I'll turn to you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, it's such an honor to be here and to be on a panel with people who I, many of whom, some of whom I have admired for my entire career. Um, I also want to say my thanks to Celeste because it was really working with you um, and when you were Associate Dean of Academic Affairs that made me really feel like I could take another step in my career um, and to be a leader. And so I just am so appreciative of everything you do for us here. Um, I've had a really weird career, and I just want to get that out first, because I don't necessarily recommend that you follow my weird career. Um, here are choices, don't make these. 
but one of the reasons I think it's a weird career is because I have really, although I didn't do it intentionally, been just consumed with understanding how people that we think are similar, that we think are, you know, characterized by some trait or characteristic that they share, um, are actually different. Um, and I am passionate about both recognizing these axes of inequality that exist within the world, but also understanding that people who are on an axis of inequality can be very different. Um, and those differences really matter. Um, so I did a dissertation and the first book on prison programs and really wanted to look both at prisoners and prison staff and to think about how this, you know, one overwhelming characteristic that defines them, you know, incarceration or working with incarcerated people, you know, conceals a lot of differences in those groups and how are those differences made meaningful. Um, I was, had the great good luck to come to the um, Ford School of Public Policy um, and to work with um, two people, Sheldon Danziger and Mary Corcoran, who are just giants in, um, are in having social science and particularly um, the social sciences that are not sociology, economics, political science, history, um, soci sociology, anthropology, really take poverty seriously as something to study and understand and combat. Um, and so thanks to them, I was brought into a world where I really could think a lot about racial differences um, in the experience of poverty and very proud to have put together um, edited volumes that really sort of, I think, center that important difference and why those differences within groups and how, you know, we might think they matter. Um, again, lucky to be at the University of Michigan um, in a metropolitan area, which is one of the most concentrated communities of Arabs outside of the Middle East. Um, Arab Americans, um, you, many of you probably know, um, over 300,000 in our metro area, and this is this and LA are the largest communities of Arabs in the United States. Um, and I got, you know, fascinated by how the people on the outside, especially after 9/11, see Arabs as monolithic. People from within the community understand that this is one of the most diverse communities in the world. You know, whether we're thinking about race, whether we're thinking about religion, whether we're thinking about class, um, and have been very um, grateful to be able to work um, with that community and to write about that community. Um, and then a couple of years ago, I. Um, got pulled into this problem that my friends in science and engineering were focused on, which is why was the federal government investigating Chinese American scientists? Um, and sort of from that place where I was like, okay, I'll help you proofread your letter to Congress, you know, to, all right, this is really crazy. Something important is going on here that we need to pay attention to. Um, have become very active around, you know, advocacy for Chinese American scientists, but even more than that, advocacy for understanding that China and the U.S. are two really large, important countries, very important differences and diversity within those countries, and yet we are sort of careening down a path where we try to make, like take the most cardboard cutout version of people from each country and sort of put it against each other. Um, and so very grateful now to have the opportunity to lead the Lieberthal Rogel Center for Chinese Studies and to try to bring my expertise as somebody who studies American politics into this U.S.-China relationship. Thank you. So we could spend a lot of time having panelists talk about their perceptions of what are some of the major problems we're seeing in the U.S. and globally with um, racial inequality and social injustice. What I've asked them to do, a little different, is to help us think about, from their perspective, what should be on the strategic agenda for change? What do they see as some of the most promising 
policy changes, system reform changes that are going on that will address racial inequality and social justice issues. So I'm going to start with Anne, and we'll get their thoughts on that. Um, and maybe we'll have, to, feel free to banter with each other if you, <laughs> if you like. <laughs> I'm going to be really short. Democracy is the most important structural reform and structural um, uh, structure, inst institutions of democracy are the most important thing that we need to defend. Um, the more I study China, the more I understand that authoritarian practices are not just practices that other people have, they are practices that we have here at home. And if we do not resist them for everybody, for voting rights, for African Americans, um, ballot access for people in rural areas, um, reliable um, rule of law counting of ballots, um, if we do not protect these um, institutions of democracy, we can't get to any of our other concerns about social justice. Can I build on? Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I think democracy is, is absolutely right. I would say maybe that there is no democracy without economic democracy, and that there's no racial justice without economic justice. Um, so I often hear racial justice kind of very narrowly defined as sort of an agenda that asks, you know, what do people of color, what do black people, what do immigrants need that other people do not need? And I think that's the wrong question. I think the question that I ask when it comes to racial justice is what do people of color need? And it turns out that from that perspective, people of color need what all humans need. They need good education, they need health care, they need housing, they need schools, all those things. Um, and it, so someone yesterday asked uh, Derek Hamilton about his experience working on the Bernie Sanders campaign. And it was really kind of funny seeing this uh, question of racial justice play out with his campaign. Uh, so there's one reporter once who asked him, you know, what is your racial equity agenda? And his response, predictably, and I think he was correct also, uh, was to say, you know, universal health care, Medicare for all abolish student debt, a Green New Deal for housing, all these very ambitious sort of universal uh, programs. Um, and the media kind of destroyed him for days after that, saying like, oh, you know, he has no answer to what racial justice should look like or anything like that. But it turns out that most people of color in this country are working people and working class people, and they need things that are related to economic justice, redistribution, things like that. Well, I'll, I'll take up the theme of democracy and disagree with the two of you. Um, and, and th so I want to say democracy, Anne. Um, I wrote a piece recently, well, not that recently, a couple years ago, called Death and Democracy, or either Democracy and Death, something like that. Um, and the, my, my concern as a political scientist is there has been, and I, Anne, you know, we're, we're together here, so, but um, there's been a proliferation of of the crisis of democracy, what happened to the guardrails, oh my God, Trump is horrible, which Trump is horrible. Um, but my concern is it suggests somehow that democracy was working prior to Trump. <laughs> and prior to Trump, there was the Black Lives Matter movement, there was Occupy, there was immigrant rights mobilizations, right? Um, which spoke to the kind of crisis of the basic things that Mo is talking about here, the kind of lived experience in particular of poor people, in particular poor people of color. And so I worry when we say we need to defend democracy, that we're suggesting that we need to defend a democracy that existed in 2015, which was not working for yeah. poor people and people of color. So democracy doesn't work when we see the kind of routine killing of black people. Democracy doesn't work, right, when we see Flint not having water or, you know, kids of color not having the same educational opportunities um, or young people taking on more student debt than we've ever seen before. And so I guess the question for me is that we make an, a, a broader argument about democracy, about what is the vision of democracy that we're demanding and that we're willing to defend. 
Um, and for me, it is not the kind of reinstitution or the guarding of traditional democratic institutions that have largely uh, not supported and an expansive understanding of justice and rights, in particular for communities of color. So, okay, that's my first. Uh, you want to banter. So there, there you go. Um, <laughs> but the second thing I'll say, and I took the question also to be kind of what's happening that we can hold on to that's exciting. And for me, what's happening uh, is, the, I always say I'm kind of interested in politics from the margins, the politics of resistance. And all of those moments of mobilization and movements I just talked about, it seems to me, are really opening up a new type of discussion about what should be on the agenda. We say for democracy, I might say for policy, um, policy advocates, policy makers, policy students. Um, so when I think of, uh, for example, the movement for black lives, many people would say, ah, that didn't work, right? Oh, there's no defund the police. But people are talking about policing, right? Mm -hmm. They are talking about what does it mean to have a police budget that's larger than the budget for education, right? Um, people are starting to think about how do we use the framework of abolition to think about kind of concrete policy initiatives that speak to a vision of, of getting rid of kind of carceral logics and carceral institutions, right? I would say that, in fact, the mobilization that we've seen from, in particular, young people over the last, we could say the last decade, um, has reshaped how we talk about democracy. Both the things that we need to defend, like you know the guardrails, but new guardrails, new ways of, of thinking about what is a functioning, equal, rights-based democracy look like. And, and for me, that's the exciting part of where we are right now. It may not have delivered the exact wins that we want, but they may have done something, I think, more important, which is to expand how we are starting to think about what we can expect, what we want, and what we're willing to defend. So I'll stop there. I'll piggyback <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and talk about democracy in a, in a, a different um, perspective, and that is, I think we need to think about what democracy means for different constituencies, because it doesn't look the same uh, for everyone. And, and an example I'll give you from um, the research that I've done, in, um, when I started conducting interviews in the South among black gay men, um, it was uh, between the years 2002 and 2004. And one of the things that was happening during, this is the, the second Bush administration, and one of the things that was um, happening politically is uh, a push for marriage equality. Uh, HRC and other large um, gay organizations were um, lobbying uh, Congress and, and so forth for marriage equality. And um, has a, marriage equality, uh, it will come as no surprise to many people, was not on the top of the list <laughs> for black gay men in the South. Um, or I'd say, uh, or, or lesbian women either. On the top of that list was housing insecurity, uh, employment discrimination. And so there was this mi mi mix match between a larger m politically white uh, queer organization and a kind of on the ground grassroots um, community based uh, black and brown queer organizations about what democracy meant for these different constituencies. So I think um, that there uh, needs to be an alignment um, about uh, what democracy means, because it doesn't mean the same for everyone, uh, based on power, based on class politics, and, and so on and so forth. And I think um, one of the things that I think needs to happen more is, and, and the, the, the panel before us, uh, had a discussion about this when we talk about the relationship between the academy and mm -hmm. communities. There needs to be more inclusion of more grassroots organizations and um, uh, more high-powered um, organizations that are, are uh, that have the, the platforms and the ear of politicians um, like HRC. And we can—that's a whole other <laughs> conversation we can have. Um, 
about what is needed on the ground because um, my access to marriage as an institution uh, may benefit me because I'm a, of a certain class uh, position, but that may not be what I need, you know, in because I can't get a job uh, based on some other kind of identity category. So I think um, racial justice um, looks different for many people as well. Uh, I uh, have a, a certain perspective uh, growing up as a, a working class, I call it, you know, uh, People call it working class. I would say we were the working poor. Mm -hmm. um, you know, seven people growing up in a one-bedroom household. That's that's the lens through which I arrive um, at a place like Michigan, uh, sitting on this panel. That's very different from someone um, who is the um, has the benefit of generational wealth. And so we need to think about these intersections uh, very differently depending on region, depending on class position, a lot of different uh, metrics and not just a kind of monolithic uh, lens. Thank you. you want to say Can I come back? <laughs> 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 of I mean, I, again, I mean, I think this, everything that um, everybody else has said is so crucial. I think it's so crucial to understand that, that one of the reasons we're having this conversation about democracy now is because people who were protected or privileged by the democracy we used to have are now in fear of losing some of that, and that is why we are also concerned about it. I am totally there. There's a important under, there is an important debate if you move out of the United States about countries like China, and I would just, not even countries like China, China, which has managed to, in 40 years of economic reform, eliminate extreme poverty. And we, don't take that very seriously in the U.S. because, oh, well, how do they measure it? And, you know, just because they, you know, they've achieved this, but people still, you know, there's still lots of inequality in China. And all of that is true. Right. But the deal that the Chinese government has made with its people is we will give you a better life. Don't bother us about how we give it to you. <laughs> right. And that, and I think that we, as social scientists, but also as you know, people, political actors, need to learn from China and countries like China about how you address deep poverty and social inequality and lack of social um, opportunity as opposed to just accept that in our country. And clearly, I mean, I think every person on this panel is committed to that. You know, we cannot do that without also understanding the type of government that undergirds it. Thank you. So um, we know, and especially in academic settings, we uh, understand that there's key frameworks and evidence from social science research, critical race theory, <coughs> history, uh, that have revealed very convincingly that there are structural factors and system factors in the perpetuation and codification of racial inequality and socioeconomic inequality, and that includes through law and public policy. Um, I'm taking moderator prerogative here. I'm going to lob out a question um, to my colleagues related to something that I'm working on right now, which is the pushback, the increasing pushback, primarily from state legislatures on the teaching of um, divisive concepts such as critical race theory, structural racism and inequality, um, banning of DEI initiatives, et cetera. So I'm just um, wanting to get reactions from my esteemed colleagues here about um, what we're seeing. Um, and I'll say, I, again, I'm doing research on this right now. There are 10 states 
already and more in the works that have passed laws banning these concepts. Most people think it's happening in K through 12, but in higher ed and in public institutions um, of, of higher education um, uh, regarding divisive concepts, and there's a whole other group are banning DEI, et cetera, et cetera. So I would be interested in your reactions uh, to this. So Kathy and I had the yeah. pleasure of being on uh, the list of banned authors in Florida. Um, <laughs> someone, I know, <laughs> yeah, so, someone uh, texted me and said, oh my God, you've been banned. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, and uh, it, it was fascinating to me. I was like, I didn't know I meant so much. Um, <laughs> And I, I was, then, you know, the, the New York Times picked up the story and, you know, then it was a wrap. And uh, these media, all these media uh, outlets started um, getting in touch with me, wanting me to do interviews. And I, I actually did three. And one of the ones I did was Democracy Now. Um, and I didn't mean for, I was, you know, asked to be on the program and, you know, they asked the questions. And one of the questions was, you know, what did I think about, um, you know, DeSantis's policy and, and so on and so forth. And um, one of the things I said went viral, and I didn't, I didn't it, mean for it, but I, I said, you know, DeSantis has said that um, African American studies, uh, no, no, I'm sorry, black queer studies lacks um, intellectual, there's no intellectual content or something, and I said the, the only thing that lacks intellectual content is the governor. Um, because um, he doesn't know anything about <laughs> anything, um, and specifically black queer studies or black people from what I uh, can tell because he also doesn't have a degree in African American studies. Um, but let me back up a little bit. I think one of the things that um, the left fell asleep on uh, years ago when it looked like for a while we were going to um, keep electing a Democratic president, and the right also thought that as well until Trump, um, they focused on the local level. Mm -hmm. So um, conservative voices, and it, this is not a, a thing against conservative voices, I think it, it keeps us all, I think the, the, the back and forth keeps us all honest. But there is a, a, a particular kind of co conservatism that I think started getting elected to local school boards. That's right. Um, and getting involved at the local and community level that people weren't paying attention to. So that by the time that someone like Donald Trump gets elected, it's a wrap for us all in terms of certain kinds of progress we've made uh, in terms of what gets taught in schools. You know, I am a product of a school, public school system that um, taught me nothing about the history of slavery. The only thing I got in my high school, high school, and this is in the 80s, high school, um, about slavery was that it happened, and then we moved on. Um, and so it wasn't until college that I uh, realized that, oh, there's this, this more complex history about um, how slavery happened as an institution. And to think that now, there's legislation that has been passed that suggests that K through 12 students can't even learn about a historical fact because it's triggering um, is absurd. So I think the threat um, that we're facing now is um, a lack of, of historical knowledge being passed on to the next generation of, of young people and students um, that is going to be devastating to our democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you don't understand that past, uh, there's no way that you can forge uh, a future. And um, for me, as someone who does research on and teaches and now is an administrator um, about these issues of race and class and sexuality, um, it's disconcerting to me to, to watch our institutions of higher ed uh, pander uh, to um, the legislature, watching uh, those three women presidents um, testify in front of that committee was horrifying to me. 
uh, because it was such a setup. But then to watch our institutions um, give in to it was even uh, more horrifying. So I think um, we have to resist uh, we ha as, as much as we can uh, because we, the space of higher ed, I think, is, and the, the right knows this, is the, the last bastion of the possibility of That's democracy. Right. That's right. Thank you. I'm just going to say yeah. ditto, yes, and just a couple other things. Um, one is just to say, I, you know, I would even take us back further to uh, the infiltration of the local as the right wing strategy. Again, it's not bad or good, depending on your politics. For me, it was bad. Um, but if we think about the Tea Party, right, mm -hmm. that that emerges from a strategy of taking over the local um, and eventually electing Tea Party candidates into office who can then mobilize and structure a national agenda, right? Yeah. That the right has always, I think, been um, very smart about understanding where there are possibilities for growth and control. So that's one thing I would say. Two, I worry that, in fact, those of us, and I'm in a blue state, um, didn't take this seriously enough, right? We thought we were protected. Oh, it's just Florida. It's not just Florida. Um, it is uh, in Indiana, I think they recently just passed legislation that said if, in fact, you don't present two sides of an issue. Now, an issue like slavery doesn't have two <laughs> sides, but um, <laughs> that you can be fired even with tenure, right? So it, there is both um, the direct impact, there's the signaling and the chilling effect. It will change. Um, even those of us in blue states who are teaching students and we think they're amazing, they have to go get jobs in other places. So it will have an impact on what we do. The third thing I'll just say is as someone who studies young adults, and I think to Patrick's point, which is exactly right, this is a generational warfare, right? <laughs> this is a moment of what does it mean when you teach, in particular, young people, but young white people, an accurate history of this country and their ability to then position themselves um, relative to a Democratic or Republican Party, right? I mean, that's, the, that's what's at stake for the Republican Party. It was the same type of framing after Obama when in fact they said we would never see another Republican president again, which of course we have. Um, but there are these moments where in fact um, what is in front of us feels like it will be uh, realigning the power in the country. And I think we have to take this very seriously, not in terms of just what we are able to do, but what does it mean for how in fact we teach history in this country. I would like to I echo all of that. I've been thinking about maybe more to the left of the political spectrum, mm. what, mm -hmm. where kind of liberal institutions fit into all of this. Mm. Um, and so your question, Paula, was, you know, are we worried about this? Should we be worried about this? And my short answer is absolutely. As someone, as an academic pre-tenure, like I'm personally very <laughs> worried about this. Um, I considered taking a, a job in a state that is slightly more red than Michigan and at a public university. And one of the questions I asked the provost was like, is it smart for me to take this position? Like, will this state turn the same way that Texas, mm -hmm. Florida, other places have gone? Uh, but it's interesting just following sort of how universities have responded to some of these kind of debates. Um, just a few weeks ago, uh, there were people uh, just made waves on, on Twitter and, and social media um, faculty at, in New York State, faculty in Texas, who have been either fired or suspended mm -hmm. for speaking out against the genocide in Gaza. Mm -hmm. And that is not a right-wing, yes. you know, mm -hmm. Republican governor saying that you need to do that. That is, you know, yes. liberal Democrats mm -hmm. in higher education doing that on their own. And so I've been very concerned about that. Um, I've also been concerned for a long time about how when Democratic administrations we can think about Clinton, we can think about Obama, are in office, uh, you know, DEI can mean a lot of different things. DEI can mean 
racial justice, very redistributive policies, or it could just be window dressing. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. And many democratic administrations, what they do is they pursue policies that actually create more inequality, that actually make our lives more difficult, but they speak a good they speak good language related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so in the minds of a lot of Americans, I think, and Wendy Brown has written quite a bit about this fairly convincingly, I think, um, in the minds of a lot of Americans, they see a bundling between DEI initiatives and this rhetoric that Democrats are often want to use with economic policies that actually make their lives worse. And so Wendy Brown, I think even 10, 15, maybe 20 years ago, was warning that if Democrats pursued this path where they talk about diversity, but they actually make working people's lives worse through their economic policies, there's going to be a pretty significant backlash to those diversity, equity, and inclusion policies because a lot of people just don't understand sort of the difference between all these different political agendas. Um, and so that's not to say that Clinton caused the right-wing attacks that we're seeing now or that Obama caused those things, but they certainly were complicit in producing the situation that we're in now. Yeah. The only thing I would, I, you know, I agree with everything that has been said. The only thing I would add is some scrutiny on this concept of divisiveness. If the concept of divisiveness means we need to protect young people or older people from tough questions <laughs> that you can't solve by yourself, if it means, you know, moral dilemmas, um, you know, you can't, I think our position should be, you cannot be human mm -hmm. without confronting divisiveness, without confronting moral dilemma. Um, and what kind of a, you know, world are you trying to create where people are protected from learning about bad stuff. It's a world in which you are eventually told this is your, th this is the stuff you can learn and everything else, don't bother. Great. Thank you all so much. Um, time has passed quickly. Uh, we don't have a lot left, so I want to turn it over to the, the audience now. So I assume we have some questions that have come in. So Katrina and Kellen, thank you. Thank you, Paula, and thank you all so much for being here. So uh, a question we received is, the type of work you all do is very hard, and I have no doubt personally exhausting. What advice do you have for students and other scholars of color who are motivated to work in the arenas of politics, policy, and racial justice? All right, I'll go. Uh, don't, no, I was, no, that, that's, that's, that is not my answer. Um, one of the things that I have found, one is um, yesterday I was listening to um, the first session, and I think it was the first session, someone brought up joy. And I, I do think that there is a way in which um, when we talk about all the difficulties and challenges, it feels depleting, which is absolutely true. But you know, the idea of in struggle, you meet people that you love, who nourish you, who you care about. I'm here next mm -hmm. to a dear friend, Mary's there, Celeste, you know. So um, to say that as we join collectively to do good work, you meet good people and, and you feel like you're a better person or they helpfully, hopefully make you a better person. But the other thing I would say is, at least for me, I have never um, contained my work to the academy, mm -hmm. meaning um, I am deeply invested in doing work that is meaningful to organizations and people and activists who have a vision of struggle um, outside the academy. And just very quickly, I don't want to take all the time. Um, I have a survey project called the Gen Forward Survey Project. We survey 3,000 young adults with oversamples of young folks of color. Um, and I do this and we do this work, one, because it provides us with data and as social scientists we think data is important, um, but also because we do it because we want to support the work of movement organizations to think in complicated ways about both what they're asking for and also how they're organizing. So we recently just published um, 
a report with the Movement for Black Lives on how black people imagine public safety, mm -hmm. right? So if we go beyond just the framework of defund the police, how do they think in complicated ways about the need to feel safe, but understanding that they don't trust and they actually fear the police, right? And so how can we map that out? And it seems to me that in doing that type of work, right, you, you, you build relationships, you extend yourself outside the academy, you feel like the work is meaningful and that there are organizations who can kind of push the work forward. So I guess I would just say to think broadly about who your collaborators are and the, and the reason you're kind of in the arena doing work. Because I think if, in fact, you can make those types of relationships, um, you will feel good in the end. Even though you're exhausted, you'll feel like you've done the right thing. Oh, me? <laughs> so um, I became dean August 1st, 2020. <laughs> That's all I need to say. Um, and um, I am what the, the um, search firms that do searches for deans and provosts and all those presidents um, call um, reluctant leaders um, um, because I didn't want to do this. Um, and and who would you know want to take on an administrative role, uh, especially at this moment? But even then, in the middle of a, a global pandemic and uh, post George Floyd and protests and all the things that was going on at, in that moment, and I and I look back at that time and um, realize that I was in a deep depression um, during all of that. But about six months in, um, I had to give a report to the provost all deans do about what you've accomplished and you know what are your what's your strategy um your goals for uh, the coming year and when i looked at all the things that i had accomplished just in six months by just sitting at home <laughs> being on 10 hours of zoom um i realized that I was the right person at the right time for the job, even though I didn't want it. I was probably the right person for the job uh, at the time that I got it. And looking at that list of things that I accomplished did bring me joy. Because people kept asking, me, how are you enjoying being the dean? I said, there's no joy. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? But seeing other people's lives being transformed by the smallest of things that I was able to leverage as dean did bring joy. So my advice is, um, and it may sound cliche, is lean into the thing that you're most afraid of mm -hmm. because you never know the impact that your leadership, your activism, your whatever the case may be, the impact that's going to have on communities uh, that you want to serve and that you want to help elevate. And now I can, you know, four years in, I can say that um, more things bring me joy. Yes. Uh, it's not a joyful job, but more things bring me joy. And I, I take solace in the fact that uh, because of who I am and my framework for leadership, I'm able to um, do some transformative things while I'm in the role. I um, have I have a chronic illness, but I had that chronic illness in its, you know, worst manifestations. Basically, make it very difficult for me for about 15 years of my career to do anything that I was supposed to do well. Um, and I came out of that experience um, realizing that, you know, if you always measure yourself by what you should do, um, you'll always fall short. Mm -hmm. You know, the world, the work that is there is too big, you know, for anyone to do. It's probably, again, coming back to this idea of humanity, good for us all to be a little bit more humble about what it is we could do. Um, and so once I you know, didn't come to it easily, you know, sort of was pulled to it kicking and screaming, you know, realized that that's, you know, this is 
what I have. Um, this is what I can do. Um, I'm much more grateful these days about being able to do anything at all. Um, and, you know, I think that it, it has been a, you know, I see so many of my colleagues who are doing fabulous work and so many people outside of the academy who are doing fabulous work, but they keep getting bogged down because they know there's so much more out there. Mm. And I think we just, you know, has, as humans, have to tell ourselves, you know, this is what we can do. You know, this is what we can do. And, you know, and trust. You know, that when you have more capability, you will do more. When the situation gives you the opportunity, you will take it. And that's really what I think, Patrick, when I listen to you talk, right? I mean, that's, you know, you didn't ask for the situation. It came to you, right? And then it gave you the possibility to do things that maybe you didn't realize, you know, needed to be done or could be done, right? Oh, my turn. <laughs> um, no, I second everything that everyone has already said. Um, injustice in many ways thrives on precarity. Mm -hmm. And in a precarious environment with very, a very minimal social safety net, uh, I think a lot of us worry about sort of speaking out for political causes or, you know, being too radical because then what consequences will we face at work or in other kind of spaces and things like that. Um, but I think just seeing activism from the last really 10 years, I mean, yeah, Occupy, Black Lives Matter, and now the, the protests that we see on campus for, for, Palestine, for Palestine, you know, happening weekly, if not daily in some cases. Um, there are a lot of opportunities for bravery, a lot of opportunities for courage. And if more of us are fighting for racial justice and, and racial equity, uh, they can't take all of us down. So it actually does make us safer <laughs> when more of us kind of step up and, and fight for things that we believe in. How do we ensure our focus on racial justice is expansive enough to include a global context? Relatedly, where do you see intersections as they relate to broader conversations on multi-directional solidarity within racial justice movements? Heavy questions Since for a Friday. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> um, We often are very quick to say, you know, people who work on X, they're very consumed by X. I know they're consumed by X. That probably means that these other things aren't important to them. Right. Um, and we don't give others a chance, I think, in sort of saying, your, I identify you with X. I think that X is not open or not sympathetic or maybe just doesn't care enough about this. So I'm not going to reach out. Right. And, you know, as I think, you know, we will say, I mean, people are so much more diverse and different from that. If you start from the premise that I want to understand you, I don't just want you to get you to do what I think is important, right? Um, and I think it's a very logical, you know, you are consumed by something, that's what you're going to work on, of course, you know, and so you often don't have necessarily the space to reach out, and that's okay, you know, you do what you can do, but, you know, we can make it easier for us all to reach out by sort of, you know, and the person who sort of extends their empathy you know, or their desire for empathy first. I mean, I think the, the, um, you know, the obviously the benefits from that are really, um, are really life changing, movement changing, life changing, all of those things. Yeah. I get, oh, you, no, no, you, Mo, it's <laughs> all you. It's all you. Okay. I feel like, let me just go. Not because I want to go in front of you, but because you have done such an important work of putting Gaza into the conversation, and I don't want that to fall only on you, right? Um, and I, I do think that part of what I have learned um, is that the framework of racial injustice 
anti-blackness, white supremacy, settler colonialism, travels, mm -hmm. even if people aren't able to travel themselves. Yeah. So in our survey data, we note that black people are much more likely to express concern about this administration's position on Gaza. Yeah. Not because they've gone to Gaza, yeah. not because they fully understand that um, the condition of settler colonialism there. It's because, in fact, they recognize racial injustice. I think we could say the same, and it's not the same, but the concern about Haiti, right? Um, and the condition of people in Haiti and the lack of engagement from the US government in thinking about Haiti. So I, I do think there are ways in which those of us who have an opportunity either in the classroom or outside of the classroom in the political work that we do or supporting others can begin to expand our framework again in thinking about what is a racial justice, an international, intersectional, global racial justice framework look like. That is not to smooth out or to ignore really important differences or to say that we don't always understand um, all of the nuances and there are always nuances right in different parts of the world but it does mean that to Patrick's point we should lean in to building on what we understand here and trying to assess how it travels elsewhere. Um, whether it is Gaza, whether it is Haiti, whether it is Ukraine, if in fact we suggest that we are committed to racial justice, it cannot just be racial justice in the United States. It has to be a kind of broader, more global commitment to racial justice. Now it's and, your turn. And, no, that was beautifully stated. And I, th there's a long tradition of what used to be called third worldism, third world solidarity, between left movements and racial justice formations in the United States with the global south and the rest of the world. Um, and so my own political kind of consciousness, the kind of earliest moments that I remember in my life were protesting the war in Afghanistan, protesting the war in Iraq. And that was really important in my own uh, sort of political sort of consciousness, my own trajectory. Um, and for a long time after those movements, the anti-war movements sort of died down here in the United States, I was pretty worried that it would actually never come back. Like, I think there was a, a definite decline in sort of connections between the United States and the rest of the world in our social movements. Um, but in the last few months, I'm actually not worried about that at all. I think we're reclaiming a lot of that energy um, because racial justice cannot be limited to the United States. The United States is not just, you know, a random country in the world. <laughs> The United States is the only global superpower. It is an empire. It maintains colonies all around the world. Yes. And so the position of the United States, if we're thinking about racial equity, as Americans, we actually can't just be limited to the borders of the United States. We need to think on a global scale. Great. Um, so this question comes from one of our amazing MPP students. What advice do you have for policy students hoping to advance racial justice and equity for example, reparations for black Americans in a space where progress has often been limited by bureaucratic structures and perceptions of political feasibility. Well, I'll speak as, a, as an Evanstonian. No, I knew you were going to <laughs> claim it, claim it. Um, my, part of my taxes in Evanston um, and the sell of pot go to, I'm not selling pot. <laughs> I just want to be clear, we're filming this, I'm not selling pot. <laughs> oh my gosh. Part of my taxes and the sell of uh, legal marijuana uh, goes toward reparations um, for black residents of Evanston. And um, I think, um, Oh, I'm a part of two communities that, that, that has happened. So Evanston and Mary, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Evanston was the first city in the U.S. to have this. But uh, another, my home state is North Carolina, and Asheville uh, also now uh, provides reparations to uh, black communities vis-a-vis -vis, um, property ownership. Um, so I think that's a start. Um, 
And I also think that, again, going back to my story about how I became a dean and how reluctant I was, I think it's also important for us to, as policy students, as scholars, academics, to get involved um, at the community level in which we live, um, joining school boards, joining, um, you know, running for, uh, God forbid you, um, running for office for um, city council, um, so that policy is affected uh, at that level. Uh, because I don't think, and Evanston is sort of a, um, an anomalous situation uh, because of its um, history of, of, of political activism, but I think um, a policy like that, like reparations for uh, black folk, couldn't have come about had not certain people been on city council. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important for us to be in these positions, whether we want to be or not, because it is hard work, um, so that we can affect change, because being around the table does matter. Uh, because even if we're not the ones that actually lead to the actual change, maybe we can hold the door open for someone else to come in, to join us around the table, and take up that mantle. Um, so I think it's really important that we stay engaged and not um, just leave it up to everybody else to, to do um, that work. I just want to say to the young public policy students, first of all, congratulations. You have the most amazing dean. You should be in the academy. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm going to go back to where I started earlier, which is to say I feel like young activists have expanded the framework through which you should be doing your work. So what does it mean to pr produce a kind of policy agenda that moves forward an abolitionist framework and commitments, right? Um, what does it mean, I was, I was talking with Derek yesterday about this, baby bonds, I love baby bonds, but how do we think about baby bonds in relationship to racial capitalism? So is it a way to circumvent and keep capitalism in place and tolerable? Or should we be directly thinking about what are the policies or how do we even frame baby bonds as a way to address racial capitalism, right? How do we think about participatory budgetary policies, right? And the ways in which you can allow communities, limited even autonomy, to decide on what the investment looks like for their spaces, right? So I just think that there are ways in which young activists have provided us with new frameworks for thinking about policy work. And now it is incumbent upon young policy makers to kind of reimagine what the policy field might look like. And I'm, gonna, I'm looking at Mary because Mary said this great thing yesterday about we often kind of lean back into tried and true policies because we have data on those. Yeah. Right? How do we produce cutting edge commitments to new policy agendas where we don't have data, but where we are testing them out? And I, I just think that this is one of those moments where you can shift um, the policy agenda. And I think you have uh, a leadership team that would support that type of risk taking um, that is embedded in hearing and partnering with communities who will be on the front line of receiving those types of changes in policy. And actually connecting oh. that point to this interna the international question that came before yeah. this, also many policies are not tried and true in the United States, but are tried and true elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And so even looking beyond the U.S. Yeah, borders, right. for examples of what you know, we can do here. Yeah. I heard this argument a lot with universal health care. Well, we don't have the data on what universal health care will look like. <laughs> well, there are actually plenty of countries in the world, you know, <laughs> Canada, Western Europe, that have universal health care. I've lived a good part of my adult life in Brazil. Brazil is a country that is very similar to the U.S. in a lot of ways, but it is much poorer than the U.S. And in Brazil, there's universal health care at, free at point of service. And so I, multiple times as an American, uh, have gone to get health care in Brazil uh, while living there and as an American I go with my you know ID cards and my credit cards and bank statements try to get all the financial information that I can to them 
Uh, and the first time I went in, they just laughed at me. Like, no, we don't, we don't handle anything related to money here. You just come in, tell us what you need, and we provide you with health care. And it's not a perfect system by any, chance, by any means, but uh, it's definitely tried and true compared to what we have here in the U.S. Yeah, yeah, hard support. I mean, I think there are so many models out there that we, you know, limit ourselves by not, by not just looking within our own borders or just looking within our own group. Um, and the other thing I would say is I would, I, I've been part of the Ford School for a long time. I love the focus on policy analysis that we have and the commitment to analysis. I would also say that we could do more to encourage people to be creative about solutions. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if you're creative about solutions, nine out of 10 of them are going to be sort of dumb, but that's okay. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know you, the, the way you figure out whether it's dumb or not is sort of to work through the implications and the support and, you know, who it would help and who it won't help, etc. And I think we're sometimes afraid to have a space where students can be just be creative about what if we tried this? Mm -hmm. Or what are the building blocks that I would need if I wanted to start sort of tearing policies apart and putting them together in different ways? We have time for one more question. Okay. Can black, queer, and more broadly racial liberation occur within current public policies? How much should the most marginalized expect the system of public policy to provide a politic of liberation? <laughs> I just have never thought about a policy, yeah. politics of liberation and policy. But, uh, huh. Uh, I, I, well, okay. I mean, I, I think a politics of liberation will undoubtedly involve policies. Uh, say the, can, oh, go ahead. Can you just read it again? Because it was a long question and it had a lot of different parts. Okay, yes. Okay. You put two together? There was, it was uh, see, one suspicion, yeah, uh -huh. but it had two yeah. questions. Okay. <laughs> okay. Can black, queer, and more broadly racial liberation occur within current public policies? How much should the most marginalized expect this system of public policy to provide a politic of liberation? It's the second one that throws me off. But I, one of the things I will say, to the, in answer to the first question, yes, the possibility is there, yes. Um, I think... Um, one of the biggest questions right now around policy and black queer life is um, black trans women and the rate of their murder, mm -hmm. access to health care, uh, and so on. And uh, that is driven by policy. And um, there are so many states that are passing anti-trans uh, bills that are um, actually making the situation worse. It was already bad, but it's um, making it worse um, in terms of access to um, health care, but also uh, just protecting their lives when they are murdered and the people are caught. Um, and so I think that um, there's lots of organizing around this, um, particularly in Chicago mm -hmm. um, and other parts of the country. Uh, grassroots organizations, um, and we also have um, uh, folks in Washington who are also advocating uh, for uh, a, a change in the policy. My partner right now, my husband, is in D.C. right now uh, meeting with I know, this is crazy, because he's not a politician. But anyway. He's like Steve. In, um, okay, yes. Right. And he just, he just texted me last night. Um, he's on Capitol Hill. He just texted me um, last night a, a sign outside of um, that woman from Georgia's office. I won't call her name. Um, that says, um, bathrooms are for men and for women. Follow the science. And... Um, it's that kind of ideology and idioticy um, that has a uh, deadly uh, impact on um, trans people and, and, and black trans women and men specifically. And so there is a possibility, but we, we have to um, 
be vigilant around um, these uh, legislative uh, policies that um, are really impacting and making people more vulnerable um, to crime, to uh, uh, homelessness, uh, and uh, jeopardizing their lives. So, I, again, there is a possibility, but we have to stay vigilant. Can I just say, really, I think everything you said is right, but not about liberation. Mm -hmm. So I think all of that is absolutely right in terms of keeping people safe, in terms of uh, respecting their dignity. But when I think of liberation, I think there are systemic changes that have to happen way beyond policy. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to discount the importance of safety, liberation, agency, and power as a way as moving us towards a path towards liberation, right? I, for, for me, there's a mm -hmm. tension mm -hmm. there, um, a systemic tension, but yeah. I really regret that uh, in the role of moderator, I'm also evil timekeeper, so um, <laughs> our time is up. Uh, there was so much more we could talk about. I wanna um, thank all of you and the audiences for joining us today. And for those who are here, please join us for a lunch out in the Great Hall um, right now. But thank you so much. Please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. today, but also for your ongoing, inspiring, and amazing work that you're doing in the areas of racial justice and social equality. Thank you all, and thanks to all of you.